Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all here today with us. Um, we are going to get started in just a minute with Jennifer Strauss for helping children build a bigger vocabulary today, part of our best story time practices. But in the chat box are our links um, to today's handouts, as well as our evaluation. Um, at the end of the webinar, if you can take just one minute, two minutes to fill out that evaluation for us, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, this program is brought to you by the Institute of Museum and Library Services through the Library of Michigan. And I am Kathy Lancaster, the Youth Services Coordinator at the Library of Michigan. So um, without further ado, I'm going to stop my share and introduce Jennifer Strauss. Hey, Jen. Hey, Kath. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in Traverse City, Michigan, we have experienced an early spring. I don't know how long it's going to last. Um, sounds like winter might return, but spring is here and it's um, brought a renewed hope after such a long year in this pandemic. So I wanted to start by sharing with you a few things that have happened that have been wonderful in the last few weeks. And then I'm going to invite you to share in the chat box just one thing that has happened coming out of this pandemic or nearly coming out of this pandemic that has been wonderful for you. Um, for me, I just got uh, my first COVID shot uh, and I will get my second shot next week. And two weeks after that, we'll be able to go into classrooms again. I've been actually hired um, to do some live programming for the first time in a year. Some libraries in the Superior Land Cooperative will be bringing me up in July. Betanox Schools is bringing me in live in April. And so I'm starting to see some of those live performances again. And then finally, I get to go see my 92-year-old Aunt Ellie very, very soon. So please put in the chat box something delightful that has happened for you lately as we start to emerge slowly out of this year that we've been through that's been very challenging. So I'm going to check it out there and see what you're putting. Yes. I see Thank there's you. a new grandson. Spring. Vaccinations. Hairdos. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I love seeing all these vaccinations, Jen. Yeah. Other good things. Let's see. Set up the patio. You be careful out there. <laughs> One of your library um, colleagues, Vicki Shirley, who's at um, Mission Peninsula Library, she put out her furniture this weekend and she said, I'm sorry, Mission Peninsula. I'm probably going to make it snow. So be careful there. I <laughs> saw the first robin. Tulips and hyacinths are starting to pop up, starting story walks. Oh, yes. Son was born at the beginning of the pandemic and just turned one. Oh, my goodness. What stories you will tell that little one, right, about when he was born. And that'll lead into some of the things we're going to talk about today. So it's good to see you and good to see some positive things happening out there. We're going to be talking about growing vocabulary in our young patrons today. And, of course, I would like to start with a story. Um, before the story, I would like to bring to mind the idea that talking is our biggest way to grow vocabulary with our young ones. And that comes in the form of running commentary that we need to teach parents to do. Talking all the time about everything so that the quantity of words that that little one is hearing is growing all the time and helping them grow their language. So many years ago, I worked for the Institute on Media and the Family and had the pleasure of working with one of my mentors whose name was Dr. David Walsh. Dr. David Walsh wrote many books about the dangers of too much screen time and how to help children grow their brains. And so he told a story many years ago that stayed with me in the light of running commentary and talking to our children in an ongoing on an ongoing basis to help them build their vocabulary. Dr. Dave was heading into a grocery store one evening. He followed a young mother into the grocery store who had a little girl that he figured was somewhere between the ages of two and three. It was at the end of the day and that mom put that little girl in the basket of that grocery cart and started to move down the aisles of the grocery store as that little girl started to cry. 
And the crying was so loud that Dr. Dave said he heard the sound of the little girl crying and he was going down the same aisle as that mom and that little girl. He heard the mother say, oh, Susie, I know it's been a very, very long day. So we're just going to pick up some groceries at the grocery store and then we're going to go home and I'm going to make a lovely dinner and then we're going to take a warm bath. We're going to read a book and then we're going to go to sleep. Well, Dr. Dave said that didn't calm the little girl down at all. In fact, as he followed this mom and little girl up and down the aisles of that grocery store, the crying got louder, the squirming got more desperate. In fact, now the little girl was wailing with big crocodile tears coming down her cheeks. Dr. Dave was curious as to whether this mom was going to keep her cool, and he kept following her. And as that little girl started to wail even louder, the mom didn't lose her composure at not one bit. She said, oh, Susie, it has been a really long day. We're just going to pick a few groceries up here for dinner, and then we're going to go home, and we're going to make a delicious meal, and then we're going to take a warm bath, and we're going to read one of our favorite books, and then we get to go to sleep. Well, that little girl continued to cry and wail all the way up to the checkout line and Dr. Dave's curiosity was piqued and he followed that woman right into the checkout line with the items that he had to buy that day. And as she rolled into the checkout, that little girl had lost all control, but not the mom. The mom just said, as she placed those items onto the, the grocery band said, oh, Susie, I know you're upset and it's been a long day, but we're just going to pay for these groceries and we're going to take them home and make a nice dinner. And, and then we're going to take a warm bath and we're going to read a good book and then we're going to go to sleep. Now, Dr. Dave couldn't contain himself and he looked up as that woman was putting the bags of groceries back into her cart. Susie still wailing or so he thought. And he said, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I've been watching you since you entered the store. And it looks like your little girl is having a rough time. Susie looks really upset, but you never lost your cool. You never, ever lost your calm. You just kept engaging her in conversation. And I just want to commend you. What a great mom you are. The mom looked at Dr. Dave, looked at the little girl that was still in the cart, and then looked back at Dr. Dave and said, her name is Amy. I'm Susie. <laughs> That's the only way that I could get through this trip to the grocery store. <laughs> now, funny story, right? How we calm ourselves down when our children aren't so calm. But the point of the story for Dr. Dave that day was that we have to keep our composure and we have to keep having running commentary with our children, no matter what's going on, to help them build their language. So that's what today is going to be all about. So I'm going to share screen here. Hang on just a second here. And just some reminder slides, okay? So if you've been with me before for any of our story time, our best story time practices webinars, then some of this is going to be familiar, but I just want to remind us today of a few things about the brain development in these young ones and how important it is to build vocabulary and build language experiences on all levels when we're working with those young ones. So I want to remind you that children are born with brain cells, of course. And this is an artist representation of just one brain cell. I always use fuzzy, fuzzy sticks when I'm talking to parents about how their children's brains wire around the experiences that they're having. And so one brain cell or one nerve cell in the brain, that's the axon or the cable that those messages zip up and down. The end and all those branches are called the dendrites, just reaching out to connect with another nerve cell in the brain when an experience is had by that child. So some facts, and this is probably one of only two slides that you're going to see this much data on. But a child is born with 100 billion nerve cells or neurons on the day that they're born, 100 billion. Each of those nerve cells has 10,000 dendrites on the end of that nerve cell reaching out to wire with another nerve cell in that child's brain. So fast math there, right? That means that there could be the possibility of one 
quadrillion possible configurations, but that's only true if those nerve cells wired one to one. We all know that's not how a child's brain develops, not one to one, but reaching out and making many connections with those dendrites to all the experiences that they are having and not making those connections if they're not having rich language experiences during those really important years, zero to five. So when a baby is born, only 17% of the neurons in their brains are already wired. That would be the automatic or hard wiring that we're born with, like breathing and blinking and digestion. That means that 83% of the neurons that are wired in that child's brain happens after they're born. We call this the soft wiring, and that wiring in a child's brain after birth, or that 83%, is totally experience dependent. The only way that that brain is going to wire is that they have the experiences, rich plethora of balanced experiences that help that child's brain to wire. Okay. So we know that zero to three, zero to five is a window of opportunity. It's a window of sensitivity in the brain development of a child. We call it the blossoming time because those dendrites on the end of those nerve cells, zero to five, are expanded and reaching out for those experiences. And if those experiences are not given to that child, zero to five, then what happens is a pruning experience. Those nerve cells do not wire together. Instead, they wither away and that experience is lost at that very important growth time of life. So brain development is experience-based. Neuroscientists say the nerve cells that fire together are the ones that wire together. And so language development is only experience-based, okay? So it's dependent upon three things when a child is developing. The first thing that this language development is dependent on is observation. What are they seeing? When somebody's talking to them or making motions or playing with a toy or doing anything with that child, they're in the process of observing everything that's happening, very important to their, la their language development. What comes after that observation is imitation. I'm going to try and make those sounds. I'm going to try and make those movements that mommy is making. And so imitation comes second. And then finally, with the development vocalization comes third. And those are all woven together, observing outside of themselves, imitating what they're seeing, and then vocalizing as they learn those words. We know that storytelling is, for human beings, our very first language. Reading and writing is a second language to all of us. Storytelling is, by our birthright, our human language and what is our common denominator. We think retain and learn with images that our brain turns into meaning. And so as our brain takes in those images or creates those images and translates that into meaning, that translation is into words. But storytelling is our first language. There is a necessary language funnel that we help develop in children. Because storytelling is our first language, we speak we tend to speak with way more words than we read or write with. And so as their first language, storytelling, explaining their world, and listening to all of the world being explained to them, speaking builds a bigger vocabulary in our little ones at first. If we give them tons of language experience and build that vocabulary, they're going to be better readers when they go to read. And so that funnel, we don't want it to be too narrow when it is the vocabulary that they're going to read with. The more language experience they have, the more vocabulary they're going to have to read with. And the same is true for the writing process or drawing symbols of print on paper. The more speaking experience, the more reading experiences, the better they're going to be at writing later on in their life. We don't want it to be a funnel. We want it to be more of a language column that we're giving to our little ones. Okay. So you've heard me talk over and over again about the five practices of talking, singing, reading, writing, and play. We're all familiar with them now, and in your handouts, you're going to see that I included a sheet on those and then a special sheet that, that highlights vocabulary and how the five practices can help us help little ones build vocabulary. Today, in the activities that I'm going to share, we're going to combine those um, practices in many different ways.
All right. We know that talking and running commentary is incredibly important. It's not always quality, it's quantity, although quality doesn't hurt build that vocabulary, right? So talking to little ones, ongoing conversation, just like Susie and that upset little girl by the name of Amy. She kept the commentary going, singing and dancing, reading and talking about what we're reading, writing and pre-writing activities playing and role playing so that we can vocalize the idea of being in different roles and stories and that vocabulary build, builds because of that. And we want to also caution parents that if we let the storyteller become the screen, then that window of opportunity or sensitivity that we know is happening in a child zero to five is gonna wither if this is where they're placing their child to get their language experience, it's not gonna grow. Okay, so we're going to combine the five practices today in a number of different activities I'd like to share with you. But I want to share in your handouts first, eight tips for building a bigger vocabulary. And if you have your handouts, you can follow along. And if not, you can follow along with me on the screen. Okay, so number one, children learn the meaning of most words through everyday experience with oral and written language. Vocabulary includes words that we must understand in order to communicate effectively and involves listening. Check it out. Five practices, right? Some of them. Listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Young readers must make sense of the words that they use orally to make sense of the words that they're going to see in print. Totally connected. Number four, helping children build their vocabulary whoops, sorry, is essential for helping them learn how to read and comprehend. Children who hear more words at home enter school with a bigger vocabulary and become better readers and writers. That language funnel that we saw in the slides. Most vocabulary is learned indirectly in three ways. Engaging in daily language experiences, listening to people read to them, and then reading independently from the very get-go, even just looking at books without being able to read those words yet and understanding how to read a book. Number seven, Direct instruction helps children learn difficult words that are not a part of their everyday experiences, like unfamiliar words and texts and songs. We're going to talk about this later. And then finally, the ready to read five practices help children build a bigger vocabulary. So we're going to combine those today. All right. So if you have your packets, you can follow along. If not, know that um, I always say this, I give you an anal amount of handouts. And so everything is really well described in those handouts. So if you haven't had a chance to download them and print them, you'll be able to go back to them later and see exactly what I was talking about in all of these activities. Okay, so we're going to start today by combining chalk and play. And I want to introduce you to several activities today that are going to take talking and playing with children and build their vocabulary. Um, so in order to do this, the adults um, in their lives need to listen attentively and interact with children in conversations. You being the youth librarian who's one of the adults in their lives can do this through the, the, these activities. The first one is called What's Happening Here? I've been doing this activity for a number of years as a writing prompt for third through seventh graders, but I also want to show you how to adapt this activity for vocabulary building in patrons no matter what their age. So you can see in your handouts uh, the explanation for this um, game and also what you're going to need in order to um, present this game. So the game works this way, whether you're going to pull three objects and place them in front of your patrons. You can do this as a large group and build on. You can do this by putting patrons in partnerships. Can you be good if we go over toward the kids' clothes? Oh. Oops, did I miss something? Nope, Kathy, somebody did... unmuted, I got them. Okay, so you can do this as partners, you can do it in small groups, or you can do it in a large story time group, whatever way you want to do this. And there's several different ways of building on the game. So let's start with the youngest patrons and how you might do this. And so, um, and I also referenced in your handouts the grab and go that I did last month for families. We had a bag of objects. Um, Jonathan Gottschall in his book, The Storytelling Animal, he did some research and the research indicated that human beings given three of any symbols or any objects 
will automatically start to create a story from those three images or those three objects. And so in the bag, I'm gonna pull out three objects. And so if you were doing the story time and you were doing what's happening here, you would have a mystery bag filled with objects, lots of them so that you could play this game a number of different times with your group. And you'd pull out only three objects at a time. All right, so let's see what comes out. I've got a little kitty cat. I'm gonna pull out a little girl and a kitty. And in the chat box, I want you to put some ideas that you might have and a pair of binoculars. So the game works this way. You show the three objects, the little girl, the binoculars and the kitty that came out of that bag. And you say to your group, what's happening here? And together they start to create a story. So in the chat box, kitty, little girl and binoculars. What do you think is happening in that story? <laughs> the little girl is teaching her kitty how to hunt. The little girl is looking for her lost cat with the binoculars. Kitty cat's looking for a friend. Little girl is looking for her lost cat. Little girl and cat are watching the birds. Okay, nice ideas. So in any given story, and what you might talk about before you do this game is that there's always a character somewhere at a certain time doing something. So someone is somewhere, sometime doing something, okay? And that's the basis for any story. So as you pull these three objects out of the bag, you should remind them of who the character is, someone. So little girl, kitty cat, is somewhere. We didn't say where they were, so that would have to be added. Maybe they're out in a field or in the backyard. When did this happen would be sometime. This happened yesterday. It happened last summer, so sometime. And then the problem in the story, what are they doing, right? What is the action causing them to do? And in just a few minutes, you came up with ideas like the kitty was lost or teaching the kitty how to hunt or they're out looking at birds. And so a little bit of that story forms. If you do this by pulling these objects out of bags, and you have your um, patrons working with partners, it's really fun for them to develop that story together and then they can get up and they can tell their story to the whole group. If you do it as a whole group, you can keep pulling items out of the bag and see where the story goes after that. And so as you pull objects out, then your patrons would have to continue that story. And then you get into the idea that there's a beginning to that story, there's a middle, and at the end, that story has to come to an end again. So that's the young way to do it, is to pull items out of a bag and let your young patrons create a story and ask questions and talk about that, knowing that no matter how old we are, every story includes someone who is somewhere at some time doing something, usually causes a problem that gets solved by the end of the story. So that's the young way to do it, all right? If you have older patrons, or even the young ones can do it this way too, but a little bit older, I use pictures and just have them pull three pictures out of a bag, or you place three pictures on the felt board, or three pictures that you lay down in front of them, and the same question is asked, what's happening here? I've given you a couple links in your handouts and also printed off a few of them of some pictures of animals, some pictures of household items, but you can of course do a web search for any of the pictures you want to include in this game. But I also gave you um, the link to this game, I think it's called Green and Orange Company. I'm sorry, Blue and Orange Company awesome way to do this game. It's called Telltale. And maybe you've seen this before, but these are a packet of pictures, simple pictures that any kid could look at and start to develop this story. And there's a picture on the back and a picture on the front. So double, double your money for these pictures. So you can have them grab three of the pictures out of the pack, lay them in front of them, and then start creating 
that story. Who's in it? Where are they? When did this happen, right? And what happened to them? What are they doing? So that's a wonderful way to do it, right? Check out um, all the games that are on that site from, from Orange and Green, because there's a number of beautiful um, game ideas there that are language rich, okay? So that way. The third way that I have done this, and if you've been with me before, you may have seen this one before in another webinar. It's also called what's happening here, but now you're getting into your older patrons who have some reading ability, okay? So this might be six and above, six, seven, eight and above. I've done this game with teenagers and they have a blast with this game as well, all right? So there's three baskets. In each basket, there's a number of cards. One basket has examples of a character, so someone. The next basket has the setting, somewhere, many examples of that. The next basket has what are they doing or what is the action? What's fun about this game with your older patrons is that you can let them randomly pull a card out of each basket and I've laminated them. So there's a yellow card for the doing something, the green card for where are they somewhere, and then pink cards for the characters. And they pull them out at random and they read them. And this is really fun for partners to do this together, or you can do it as a group and come up with those ideas together. So here's what came out of my picks from the basket this time. Someone, an old wizard with a wand is somewhere at the beach, doing something, digging with a shovel. Old wizard with a wand at the beach, digging with a shovel. And the whole group would ask the question, what's happening here, right? And those partners would create that story together and then get up in front of everyone and tell that story. So it's a lovely and fun game. You can, um, you can theme base your cards, right? The someone somewhere doing something. You can make them up so that they're very simple. You can make them more elaborate if you're working with older kids, but it's a wonderful sequencing and story activity. Another fun way to do this is to do it as a group and keep pulling cards out or keep pulling pictures out and adding to that story. It gets a little complicated, you know, and sometimes they don't know how to find the ending. So you need to be one that makes them, you know, come, come to a close. How are we gonna bring this to a close? So any questions on the game, what's happening here? Younger, middle age, more, a uh, little bit older students and then even older students. And Kathy, you can help me field questions if you don't mind. Yeah, no questions so far. Some fun uh, additional ideas like oh, turning the pictures into a Mad Lips where they can fill in the blanks with, with whatever picture oh, they yeah. draw. Yep. Um, you know, uh, a writing prompt for Young Writers Club, so on and so forth. Very good. So, yep. yeah. This can, and I think I mentioned this in your handouts, this game can also be a quiet center, right? in your library where they do this by themselves. They, they pull out three pictures and maybe you have drawing materials, writing materials where they can draw pictures of what happened in sequence. Or if they have their words, they have their print on paper, they can start writing a story after pulling those three cards out. So lots of ways. And I trust librarians will take all these ideas and do amazing things with them, right? So- Jennifer, we do have a quick question. Okay. So, um, do you have like a time frame you do this activity in per age group? Well, you know that you judge when they're when they're wiggling and they're ready to move on to another activity. If you do it with partners, then you do it long enough for them, give them three to five minutes or so. And you, you know how you can judge whether they're ready or not. And they're saying, well, not ready. So if you're doing it with partners, give them time to create that story together and then start asking partners to come up and share that story to the whole group. Or if you're doing it with a whole group, let's say 10 patrons and you're doing this together and you pull those pictures out and you put them up on the felt board and you start talking about the story, you be the one to lead the vocabulary. All right, where is this story going to begin? When did it happen? And where are we? And who are the characters? And do we want to add another character? And what are they doing, right? And start taking the, those answers from your patrons. So do it as long as they're still engaged with language and vocabulary. 
and you'll know when to move on. Um, with the older kids, it takes them a little bit longer when they're pulling those cards out of the basket to get those story ideas together. And then they love getting up and telling those stories, but you have to make sure that one partner doesn't take over and that they tell that story by taking turns, right? Taking turns to tell that story. So I hope that answered that question. So the second game is called, Who Am I? And you have probably played this before. I used to play it when I was an environmental educator just to talk about animal characteristics. So you get pictures of common things. Um, I love to play this with animals, right? And so again, I've given you some um, links to pictures in your handouts. I copied a few of those, but I gotta tell you that this one, uh, the link that I've given you from the Sierra Club, check it out, free download, free download. Who am I from Sierra Club? Let me show you the quality of some of these pictures and how beautiful they are, okay? So there they are, right? To play this game or any other pictures that you want. Here's how we play it. You put those pictures real large and you can laminate them, right? And then put a string on them. And when you play this game, the pictures go on the back of the young patron they cannot see who they are, all right? So there's two ways to play this game and they get with a partner. The first way, if they're younger and they don't have all that descriptive vocabulary yet, they can play yes or no. And that means that the person who has the picture on is gonna ask questions. Let's try this, right? You see who I am? Do I have fur? You're my partner, what would yes. you say? Okay. Do I have long ears? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Can you stand up a little bit? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just show you. Okay. So this will be on my back, Hi. right? Yes. Am I big? No. Am I small? Yes. Do I have whiskers? Yes. Okay. So for the younger ones, back and forth, right? And asking questions that have a yes and no answer until that little one guesses who they are. All right. Although Brian didn't give us a yes or no. He gave us a relative to body size. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So the second way to play this game, if they're a little older, is to have that, that child not know who they are, picture on the back, only now their partner is describing them without telling them who they are. Okay, so you're small, you have fur, you have tiny little round ears, you have a long tail, you have whiskers, you like to eat seeds, sometimes you like to eat cheese, right? So when they describe enough, the partner would say, am I a mouse? No, am I, you know, what am I? Until they finally guess. And then they switch places and then another picture is placed on their partner's back and they do it again. So it's a lovely way for them to describe, you know, descriptive language and vocabulary and also to be thinking about descriptions and answering yes or no to that. So um, that's a game that I love to play to get kids talking and describing, right? The third one, I am so excited to share with you. Um, in this activity, it is a sensory storytelling hike, right? So this means leaving the library and going out around your library and finding a natural area. It's really important to scout this out ahead of time so you know exactly where you're gonna do all the activities, right? So I learned this um, way back in the 80s and 90s. I worked for an organization called the Institute for Earth Education. This is something called an earth walk that we used to do with little ones way back then in order to build their sensory awareness of the natural world. And we all know how good it is for our little ones to spend time outside. And we also know that there's a deficit right now because of screen time that they're not spending as much time outside. And it grows all kinds of wonderful things for them when they're outside. So you have to scout and maybe it's at your library that you have a natural area or a trail or gardens, or just places where you can wander around the library where there are things growing, right? You need a lot of natural stuff around you. Maybe you hold your story time at a nearby park or a nearby trail. 
And if you can do that, it will offer you a lot more variety in terms of exploration. Okay, so when you get the earth walk ready, this is pretty props intensive and in your handouts, I've given you all the props that you need for these activities. But when you start it, you tell your young patrons that you're gonna go outside on an exploring adventure. The beginning of your trail, you find a place to sit down in a circle so that you can start the experience. You tell them that they're gonna use their eyes on this hike and maybe you look around and ask them to spot something, start using their eyes and practice. Gonna be using your ears, so let's listen. What do we hear right now? Using those ears. We're gonna use our noses. We're gonna be smelling things. So you might sniff and see if anybody's smelling anything around them. And we're gonna use our hands. We're gonna be touching things to see how they feel. And we're gonna be asking ourselves how we feel as we explore and we're gonna be sharing our experiences with each other, okay? So then you start a story and this is all story-based, all right? And you, you tell them that you were out after a rainstorm the other day and you saw a beautiful rainbow. And start talking with the little ones. Have you ever seen a rainbow? What colors are in a rainbow? You can even do the rainbow song, which we've done in other um, webinars. And I put the words in your packet, right? To talk about the colors of the rainbow being red and yellow, pink, and green, purple, and orange, and blue. We can find a rainbow, find a rainbow, find a rainbow with you. So you can sing that song. But the story says that after you were watching that rainbow, the strangest thing happened. All of a sudden, it shattered into pieces and fell on the ground. And you had never seen a rainbow shatter like that. So you went on, picked up all the pieces of the rainbow. Now in this bag, and yes, it's a crown royal bag, so you can cover that up, okay? But they are just wonderful little bags, aren't they? I saved them. <laughs> all right. So what I did then was that I went to the hardware store, into the paint sample section, and cut out all the colors of those paint samples, all right? So here's the goal. You hand out a piece of the rainbow to each child and their goal on the next part of this little journey that you're gonna lead them on is to find something in the natural world that matches their paint chip. And they go with a partner and they hold it up to the rocks, to the flowers, to the grass. Now, you might want to pull out the colors that aren't going to let them match anything, right? Because you want them to be successful. But if it's blue and they hold it up to the sky, that's a beautiful match, right? So under leaves and up against bark and close to the soil and next to a rock up in the sky and maybe a strange color of, on a leaf. Maybe it's a tan color, but they start to pay attention and share with their partners all the colors that they're finding. So you determine when that walk part is gonna end and you collect all the rainbow pieces up after everybody's had a chance to share and you say, thank you for sharing your rainbow. We're gonna continue on. Next part of the story, they've been invited to a gallery an art gallery. Only the pictures in that art gallery have not been hung up yet. And so it's gonna be their job to decide what to frame as art. So you'll see in your kit that the, the props are um, frames. So matte frames that, that you would use in a picture. Clothesline, if you wanna use a clothesline to guide the gallery. So you'd let a close, you'd tie a clothesline on two sides of a trail looking out at something natural and then um, a um, clothespin, all right? So here's how it works. You take them to the gallery, you tell them that they are the artists in the gallery. Everybody gets, and this is another bag, right? So you have a backpack of props that you're carrying with you on this, on this walk. And everybody gets a frame and a clothespin. And you can just set them down both sides of a trail. Depends on the age of the group. I wouldn't do this under five. It's better between the ages of six and eight. Better between the ages of six and eight. And grownups love doing this too. So if you wanna do it as a family hike and the parents are sharing with the children, 
They'll love this. They really will. So they go along the gallery and they look through the frame until they find a scene either up close or far away that they think should be framed and is a piece of art in the natural world. And they clip their frame either on the clothesline that you've given them to kind of look through or anywhere along the trail. I like the free form with the older kids because they'll clip them high and they'll put them down low on the ground. They'll do far away, they'll do up close, all right? So once everybody's had a chance to hang their picture, you take everyone back through the gallery and you look through those frames and you ooh and you ah and you describe what you're seeing. Oh, I love the composition. Look at the colors that the artist used. Oh, look at the detail. Look at the fine details. How beautiful. What a nice scene, right? So the vocabulary is coming out of everyone looking through those pictures and describing what they see, right? So that one's called the gallery. After you view, that beautiful gallery, you have them, you leave it up, you leave the gallery up, you'll go back and clean up later, but they want to believe that that gallery is out there for anybody who wants to go view their art after that. But of course, there needs to be an afterglow. And so you tell them that we've had a wonderful time at the art gallery. Thank you for your beautiful art. We're going to go have an ice cream sundae, but we're not going to eat it. It's a sniffing party. And what they get for this one is a clear cup and a spoon, all right? But you send them off in the surrounding area to gather things because they're gonna make a Sunday that everybody's gonna sniff. So they might add some soil, they might add a little bit of leaves, maybe they add some pine, some pine needles, and then they stir, stir it up. Now, if you have older kids, you can put a marker on the side so that they name their Sunday pine needle delight, right? Muddy soil, yummy, you know, whatever. So you can put a piece of tape on that cup if you're with kids that have their words. If not, they can just tell you what the name of their Sunday is. So after everybody's had a chance to get their, their sniffing Sunday together, you meet in a circle and you're always telling them, I'll meet you down the trail. You'll see where I'm standing. When we get back together, make a circle and they share. So everybody tells um, the group what the name of their Sunday is. They sniff it and pass it to the person next to them. They get another one, right? They sniff that one and you'll be surprised. Every single one of them smells different. It's wonderful. And they describe what they think they're smelling. That one's lemony. Ooh, that one's yucky, right? And they pass them all the way around the circle. And you know what? They'll be waiting for their Sunday to come back right? And they'll say, this one's mine. They'll remember what it smells like. So that's the sniffing party, all right? So afterwards, it's easy cleanup over your shoulder, right? Dump it out, and you collect all the containers and the spoons and put them back in your packet. On to dozen touches. And so now we're going to get the touching language in there. And for dozen touches, you're going to go to the co-op and ask them if you can have cardboard egg containers. All you're gonna put on there is dozen touches. On the end, you could tell them what they're gonna find if you want, like rough and smooth, opposites, wet and dry, right? Um, rough and smooth, or you can leave it up to them, but with partners, they go out and in those egg containers, they find things that have different textures, something prickly, right? something smooth like a rock, something that's kind of sticky, maybe some sap from the tree, until they have filled as many containers as they can. Then they come back to that circle again and they pass their dozen touches around and talk about all the different textures and feel those things inside the containers to give some vocabulary to how things feel, right? So that's dozen touches. And after that, Usually by that time, especially for those little ones, it's time to go back, right, and have a snack, a real one this time. And so the very last thing that I give them to do, because we only collected one color in our rainbow, and as something to remember your time on this sensory hike together, you give them an artist palette. So I cut these out of old file folders, right, tag board. 
and it looks like an artist's palette, but you want to put a hole in it big enough for the little one to put it on their thumb and have it here. And you take a glue stick and you cover their palette with a glue stick, good amount, and then send them off to take little pieces and find as many colors from the natural world that they can find. And this is what they take home to remember their hike. It's a beautiful experience on many, many levels, and you will be amazed at the kind of language that comes out of sharing, but you have to be the guide, just like always. You have to keep that conversation going, right? So that's um, called Earthwalks, came out of the Institute for Earth Education. I used to be one of their associate staff members, and we created activities like this to keep kids outside and exploring for the health of their minds, bodies, and souls. So any questions on the earth walk, all described in your handouts. While you're putting any questions in the chat, Jen, I want to make an artist palette now. I, really <laughs> just, I might have to do that with my uh, niece and nephew soon. <laughs> you bet. Oh, Kathy, you should do this whole experience with them. They really love it. And um, some kids who are not, like if I, as I've done them in the last several years, these kids are not used to being outside and they're afraid of getting dirty and they're afraid of touching things. And we really need to help them get over that. They need to spend some time immersed in the natural world. And you're the role model and you're the guide and you're showing them how to interact with the natural world in a really, really positive way that is building some good language skills also along the way, all right? So we're gonna move on now. And the next activity that I wanna share with you is combining many of the five practices all in one. So I wanna model this for you. Um, on your handouts, it starts at the top with building vocabulary through talk, prediction, word review, reading, storytelling, singing, and play. If you've been with me at all, you know that I like to add as many of those practices into a language experience as, as we can. So I want you to be thinking about that. Top of the list are seven books that I found in a search online um, for building vocabulary, okay? Second set of books that you see in your handout are seven books that are just made for play. And we're gonna use one of those today to model this, but I wanna share with you the others. We're gonna use Mortimer. I've used it before, but there's a reason why I'm using it again. I mean, it's just an absolutely wonderful example of combining the five practices into a language experience all the way through play. So we're gonna be using that. Anything by Robert Munch is gonna be a winner because he's a storyteller first and an author second. Second, all right. Too much noise. These are all on your list. Look what the green screen's doing to that. I love it. it just disappeared. So too much noise by Anne McGovern. Perfect book to go to play. The squeaky door, retold by Margaret Reed McDonald. Amazing. These are all books with repetition and the ability to dress up and role play. So they're really wonderful examples. Right, something from nothing, or otherwise known as the tailor, the the um, folk tale, the tailor, another great one for play. Um, the drum, a folk tale from India. Beautiful concepts in here about giving things away to those who need them more than us. Beautiful repetition in that one. The enormous turnip. I didn't have the book today. I lent it out. Russian folk tale about everybody pulling a great big turnip up out of the ground. And then finally, I don't have the book, but there's many versions online of a story called The Stone Cutter, Japanese folk tale with beautiful repetition as well. All right. So we're going to take Mortimer and we're going to go through all of those practices with the story Mortimer so that you can see that all of them can be involved in one book, one story that we share. You're going to gather your young patrons together and Mortimer works with just about every age because every kid remembers the night when they didn't want to go to bed. And I always start this story by telling them that the story is about a little boy whose name is Mortimer and he doesn't want to go to bed at night. And then have a conversation with your patrons about who tells you when to go to bed. What time is your bedtime? What do you do before you go to bed? brush your teeth, read a book, put your jammies on. Are you ever scared when you go to bed? Do you ever have a time when you can't get to sleep? What do you do if you're scared? What do you do if you can't get to sleep? So we have some running commentary before that story begins. All right. So we're going to talk about 
going to bed at night, all right? The reason I love Mortimer is the book alone can be told only with the pictures, right? So I do prediction next and we don't read any of the words. So we look at the cover and we see the name Mortimer. They're gonna see it later on the felt board because we're gonna put some of the words that are difficult in this book up, okay? So Mortimer. And we look at the pictures now and we only wanna look at the pictures and we're gonna try and decide what's going on in this story before we ever read the words. So here's the front cover. What do you think our friend Mortimer's doing? He's in bed, he's got his teddy bear, but he's not sleeping. What's he doing? Chat box if you want to. Right, he's, he's singing. singing, right? So let's see what happens next. We know that Mortimer's in his bed. What do you think he should be doing? You think he should be trying to go to sleep? Hmm, let's find out what happens. So we don't have to read any words and the pictures in this are so wonderful. Well, we know he's singing in his bed. Who comes up to tell him to go to sleep? Now you're gonna take anything they offer because this isn't mom to everybody any longer, right? It might be a number of different number of different people. So who's telling them to go to sleep? Grandma, auntie, babysitter, friend, sister, right? Whoever takes care of them or puts them to bed. All right. What do you think they're saying? You better go to sleep. It's time to go to sleep. So we talk about it, right? Next picture. Did Mortimer go to sleep? What's he still doing? He's still singing. Ooh, let's see what's going to happen next. Do you think somebody else is going to come up and tell him what to do? What do you think they're going to tell him to do? They want him to go to sleep, don't they? Who comes up next? So again, this could be dad, grandpa, babysitter, uncle, big brother. You take all their suggestions, right? And does that person look like they're kind of in a bad mood? Why do you think they're in a bad mood? Well, Mortimer won't go to sleep. What do you think they're saying? Go to sleep. You'll be quiet, right? Okay. On to the next picture. Uh-oh. What's going on here? Looks like the cat's covering their ears. It looks like the man has earmuffs on and there's all those musical notes up in his bedroom. What do you think Mortimer's doing? He's still singing, right? Who do you think's going to go up next? They'll have a number of ideas of who goes up next. The kitty goes up next. The dog goes up next. But we see this picture. And in the story, it's all of Mortimer's brothers and sisters. But I had a little guy one day look up and go, it's the football team. <laughs> Loved it. Loved it. So who's up there? They're all telling Mortimer to go, go to sleep. Kitty, he's singing even louder than he did before. Who do they call? They call the police. Everybody goes, Wah! right? And so the police officers go upstairs, but where is Mortimer hiding? Hiding under his bed, right? You think he's scared? Talk, 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 right? You're gonna talk about all these pictures. Uh-oh, everybody downstairs does not look happy. What do you think they're doing? Talking to each other? Oh, they look mad. You think they're arguing with each other? They might be. Talk, 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 right? Finally, end of the story. What do you think happens? Sorry for the green screen. Our friend Mortimer finally goes to sleep, okay? So prediction through the pictures, right? Awesome, really awesome. So you go through all those pictures and do the prediction. Next step, and we're including all of this, we are going to do a word review before we read the story. We're going to see some of the words that they might see in this story. So I've got my floating felt board up here. What was the name of the boy in the story? His name was Mortimer. His bedroom was where? Yep, it was upstairs. So we're going to start looking at the words that are in the story. After they told him to go to sleep, where did they go? Where did they go back to? They went... That's right, downstairs. I'm sorry, this part probably should happen after reading. I'm sorry, but we're going to see these words in the story. They go downstairs in the story. So flip this. I'm sorry. This is like a little logistical thing that I just realized when I put this together. You're going to read it and then go over the words afterwards, okay? And <laughs> so that's okay. That. That's Let's okay, go. Jen. We've Let's got go. five minutes left, so oh, we can go. just, we most of us should know more and more. If you okay. don't, check uh, it out. 
All right, five minutes left. Here we go again, Kathy, right? Okay, so um, you're going to put all those words up and then actually read the story to them. You can go back to one of the other webinars where I've told the story of Mortimer. And the next step would be put the book down, which I always encourage you to do, and tell that story with participation. And in this story, there's kind of a song, but I turned it into a song that we all sing together every time he's singing that goes clangity clang clang, bangity bang bang, I'm going to sing my song all night. And we go upstairs and we go downstairs. And we do that with all the motions that you would use when telling that story. So you can go back into the archives and see me tell that story. At the end then is playtime. And I have gathered all the props that you would need in order to let the little ones become all the parts in that story. So Mortimer's gonna climb in bed with that teddy bear. I have a pillow, a blanket, I know this is traditional, but an apron for mom, a tie for dad to put on, kitty ears for the cat, police officer hats for the police officers. And so you go from story reading to storytelling to them creating their own version in play. I set up chairs for the bed. We put Mortimer on the chairs, put the blanket and the pillow behind him, put that teddy bear with him. And one by one, the kids come up to tell him to be quiet. Now, what's beautiful about this is you can have them come up with who else is going to come up to tell him to be quiet. And you can add as many characters as you have patrons in your group. So it's a wonderful way to combine all the five practices, right, and give them a huge language experience. You don't have to do it all in the same story time. You could spread this out over three different story times if you wanted to do it that way, all right? So any questions about going from talking to predicting to reading to storytelling and then to play with all the props and all the role play? And Kathy, can I go three minutes over? Oh, sure. I'll give you three minutes. All right. Just to describe <laughs> what you're going to see in- Some in folks may video. have to go, but we yeah. are recording this. All right. Just want to um, tell you what's in the last part of your packet. The last part is singing and singing songs and singing songs that they can add on to. You're going to see two suggestions in there that are wonderful songs that you may or may not already sing with children. One of them is the Corner Grocery Store right, by Rafi. And in that song, then you can have them add on the food that they're going to get at the corner grocery store. You can do it on the felt board. You can have pictures, but they come up with the rhymes. You know, Rafi gives us cheese walking on his knees. Rafi gives us plums twiddling his thumbs, their thumbs. Rafi gives us corn blowing on a horn, but there's an infinite number of foods that they could come up with and what they would rhyme that with, what would the action be? And then you can create those words on the felt board and have them do the rhyming words as well, create them as you go. The other song you're gonna see in your packet is called Aiken Drum, old folk tale that came out of Scotland. Aiken Drum is actually a little fairy person. And so in singing this song, he plays upon the ladle and in the song, they come up with all the parts of his body. So there was a man lives in the moon, in the moon, in the moon. There was a man lived in the moon. His name was Aiken Drum. His hair was made of, and you let them come up with a suggestion, spaghetti. His shirt was made out of something else. And so they come up with all those words. In the summer that we did the music as our theme, I had him play upon more than just a ladle because in the song, Aiken Drum plays upon the ladle. In the folk tale, that little person was the one that cooked soup over the fire. And so the ladle was next to the pot of soup. And when that little person, Aiken Drum, took a break, he played upon the ladle. But I add other instruments. He played upon the shaker. He played upon, you can have the little shakers. Played upon the noise sticks. So you can hand out instruments to have them keep the rhythm so that not only are you coming up with the parts of his body that are made out of food, you're also playing more than just the ladle. The last thing on your song sheet is um, I gave you these cards and I gave you the link. I can't remember. Oh, it's um, play. It's 
love play i forget it's in your handouts i forget who she is these are the 12 most asked for songs to build vocabulary they come with cards and you have the template in your kit so you can lay them out and ask the um you can ask your group what song they want to sing that day but your job is to one by one teach them all these wonderful language rich songs in your story times and then they get to choose right so she has given you the cards that you can laminate and hand out to your patrons to choose um, most of the songs are motion songs right like if you're happy and you know it um, bingo row 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 your boat um, head shoulders knees and toes some of them like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star don't have all the motions. Um, my good friend Beverly Meyer, who is the music lady, does this. She goes over the um, words in the songs that the kids may not know and hands them out so that while they're singing the song, that child gets to hold that word up. Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And you give them all the words that they may not know in that song and they get to hold those words up as you're singing them, but you go over those words before you sing them. So those are some song um, ideas in your packet that will help you sing and build language and vocabulary with your little ones. An hour is never too, or never long enough, Kathy. <laughs> so if you have any questions at all, please get a hold of me um, either by email. I'll put that in the chat box um, or go to my website. Let me just put my email in the chat box for everyone. And let me know if you have any questions now. You can unmute if you want to ask those questions. Yeah, and I'll just um, remind everybody to please fill out the evaluation today um, so we can continue to bring programs like this to you. Um, anybody have any questions for Jen? Jen? Yes. Were you ever scared to take the kids out into the woods because of poison ivy? Like, I have a sister who's deathly allergic to poison ivy, and I want to do this earth walk like you talked about, but I'm worried that, you know, somebody's going to pick up something right, right. and they're going to get, you know, a re terrible reaction, and then I'm going to be like, in trouble for it. Right. So here's what I suggest in the handouts and also have said this, you have to scout the area. If you don't know how to identify poison ivy, get that app on your phone and go identify it. Um, I grew up as a naturalist. I'm trained as a naturalist, so I know where that stuff is. But you're going to want to pick an area that is free of poison ivy. We have ticks as a problem right now too. I mean, I know, God, the natural world has become like a scary place. But if you need them to wear long pants and socks and shoes, you know, not flip flops so that the, and then maybe, you know, a tick check afterwards, I realize we're living in a different world, but scouting that trail and making sure that it is as safe as possible is going to be really essential. You also want to set up where the gallery is going to be, where the rainbow is, you know, where those things are going to be. So just scout the area ahead of time, know how to identify poison ivy. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Yep. I see a note there that Kathy says, if you collaborate with a local park, they have, have people there that might be able to help you. With the Earth Walk, if you can get other adults to go with you, there's going to be more language involvement, OK? Oh, I have yeah. another question. Sure. Because you talked about the pallets as their their take home project. Yep. Do you ever get in trouble for picking the flowers? Like, is that something we have to worry about? Itty, like, itty, you train them to not disturb the natural world. It's tiny little pieces, just a tiny little piece. So they're not ripping things out and they're not ripping things out of the ground. The whole goal of the earth walk is to be gently moving through the natural world, sniffing, hearing, right? Seeing and sensing. And so with the palettes, it's the tiniest little piece of color. So they might put a little bit of dirt. They might put a little piece of leaf, one petal from a flower so that they're not destroying anything. That's not what we want to send them away with is that you can go grab anything. No, no, no. We're taking a little bit of memory home with us. Just a tiny little piece. Okay. All right. Other questions? Jennifer, could you tell me when, do you know the dates that you're going to be in the Upper Peninsula? Is this Tequamanon? 
No, this is, I'm actually from Munising. <laughs> oh, okay. So right now it's looking like the week of July 14th and it sounds like I'm going to start in detour, go to Cedarville, Rudyard, and I don't know where beyond there. There's one more and I can't remember where. So if you want to get in on the end of that one, for years I did a um, summer library tour and I would just say to all of you in the UP, either start me in the east and leave me in the west or the other way around. And usually there were 10 to 12 libraries across the UP with COVID that didn't happen last summer. So um, are you part of a uh, superior land co-op? Yep, yep. Okay, so, you know, if you want to get a hold of me and get in on that schedule, please uh, email me and we can start talking about when that might fit in for you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. All right. Any other questions about vocabulary? Got some great activities in that packet, Jen. <laughs> There's yeah, a lot of cool, of course. You guys, you're gonna have to train me in like not doing so many ideas, but I always know <laughs> that you're gonna take that packet then. And you've done so much yourselves that you're gonna look at all the detailed descriptions that I've given you and you'll be able to branch off from that. And you know you can get a hold of me if you have any questions at all. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Jen. You are Thank you so much for being here today with us. All right, thank you.